If you guys will, go ahead, um, grab your Bibles if you have them, um, or turn in your phones to Matthew chapter 5. Um, as I set the stage for this, if you're joining us for the first time, we are walking through um, Matthew chapter 5, which is typically known as the beginning part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Go ahead and stand with me as you get to Matthew chapter 5. Um, the, the beginning part of what is known as the Sermon on the Mount, um, and it's called the Beatitudes, right? Um, this is part of our um, just kind of being discipled by Christ series, if you will. We really don't talk a whole lot about series. We're really, we say like if, if we've been in a series, it's, it's actually been one two-year-long series. <laughs> And it's really out of the whole thing, belief that God is going to do something in us and through us. Mm-hmm. Often we like to use the word revival to express that. So if that's true, what must we know and what must we do to be part of helping to usher in revival and be a part and be healthy enough to steward revival well? So we've gone through things like, well, what does Jesus have to say about that? We started with the end, what he said before the night, uh, on the night in which he was arrested and crucified. What did he say to make sure his disciples knew? And now we've jumped back to the beginning, and how did he start? What was he saying when he was introducing this? And Jesus went about in his ministry, and he was healing the sick, cleansing the leopards. He was casting out demons. He was expressing and displaying the power of the kingdom that he was also professing and teaching on. And so where we're at is in this teaching style profession of the kingdom that is at hand among the people that Jesus is now at in Matthew chapter 5. And we walk through several different um, what we call beatitudes that Jesus is teaching them. And again, this is not a, okay, so people who are like this will receive this. This is a, when the kingdom, which is at hand, is at work within a person, you will see this, and they will experience this. Amen. And a lot of the experience, a lot of what we might even call the reward, if you will, is something that's both here and now and in heaven. Okay? So we're going to read through this. Can I ask a quick technical question? Can anybody else hear that ringing? Is it reverberating back for you guys? All right, I'm going to switch to a handheld then. Is that okay? Or, or, or can you fix it? Nobody else hears it? Move the mic closer to my ear. All right. How about now? Is, that I, I, is it just me? Can you guys hear it? No. If, you, if everybody's like, now I'm distracted by that, just raise your hand and I'll just switch to the handheld. All right? This is why we need you, Lord. All right. Okay. So Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to start reading um, in verse 2. And Jesus opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Right, so let me reiterate what I mentioned last week. In the first three verses, blessed are the poor in spirit, those who mourn, those who are meek. Right, when I'm poor in spirit, I'm not confident in myself. I'm not built up rich in self-confidence. I realize me in and of myself, by myself, I got nothing. I bring nothing to the table. I accomplish nothing. And when I mourn over that sinful state, that dead, absolute dead place that I'm in, just me by myself without God, and mourn for the sins and the state of others. And I'm brought to a place of meekness and humility. It produces within me this hunger and this thirst for righteousness. And when I start hungering for something, I go eat of it. I start thirsting for something, I go drink of it. Righteousness begins to produce things like, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. It starts producing mercy within me. And today, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Righteousness from the kingdom at work within me will start to produce a purity of heart. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this. I believe this is so rich and so good. 
There is such depth to these few simple words. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Open the eyes of our heart to see this, Father. To know it. To experience it. Enjoy it and display it. Amen. Amen. You guys may be seated. All right. So I like starting at different parts here, if you will. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's start with what's at stake? What's available? What's up for grabs, if you will, in this? What does it say? They shall see God. What are the different ways that you think this could look like? I'm asking you. Yeah, Jamie. He'll experience like his goodness and his glory and what it's like to be in a relationship with him. Yeah, experience his goodness and his glory and what it's like to be in relationship with him. It's good. What else? Seeing him in nature. You shall see it's, it's, it's like those moments where you're sitting there looking at the mountains and they're not just an amazing landscape. It's like, God, you created those. And they will bow, right? Yeah, that's good. Kristen? Just seeing him work. I feel like when you're pure in heart, then you're looking for him mm. in the world. Yeah, there's, there's even an intentionality. So she mentioned uh, just seeing him at work in the world. And there's even an intentionality that goes with that is it, it creates in me like I'm, I'm not just seeing him passively. I am at a place where I am, I am intentionally looking for him. Yes. And I... I see him. Amen. I think you hand one up, Amen. Seeing God in other people, like yeah. our own relationships, people serving us, seeing God through yeah. their actions. Seeing God in other people through their actions. Uh, how important do you think that is in a culture where we are so easily offended and so easily want to put ourselves above others and and backbiting, backstabbing, gossiping, slandering? Like, how important do you think it is to actually see these people who are supposedly children of God as, I don't know, children of God? Come on. Yeah. Come on. In whom God works through. You have a problem with somebody? Take a second, if they are a brother and sister in Christ, just take a second and ask God, show me how you are at work in them. That'll change your perspective. Mason, did you have your hand right? Somebody in this area. She took it. Oh. <laughs> so a yes and amen to that. All right. Yeah. Say that one more time. Yeah. The, the, so the opposite of saying the purer our hearts are, the less our eyes are clouded is when, when we're not pure, our eyes are more clouded. Right? There's, there's a... Uh, there's definitely in this, not to just say, hey, whoever wants to see God, let's just see, we'll, we'll see God. There is, there is a before part of this verse that is tied to the after part. It's good. Who, who, I had a couple other hands over here. Melanie, did you have your hand raised? Um, yeah, I was reminded of the verse um, that we are to acknowledge God in all our ways, and we can only be empowered to do that if we have that pure heart. Mm. And um, this actually um, aligns with what they said about. And, yes. um, and then also, like, be, seeing God also, like, this also connects to what she said earlier about, like, because you're intimate with God, you also see how God sees. Yeah, yeah. that's so good. You have his mind, you have his mind. Yeah. So I, I, the first thing she mentioned um, was a, a, the verse that talks about acknowledge God in all your ways, right, and how that's tied to this clean heart uh, concept, this pure of heart concept. And how the whole seeing God is not just seeing God, but also seeing as God sees. Because scripture says, I don't know if you know this, but it says you have been given the mind of Christ. I don't know if you happen to pray this as much as I pray this all the time, but I remember when Jesus made the comment, he says, listen, I'm, the things that I do, I do because I see the Father at work and I join him in it. The things I speak, they're not even mine. We're talking about Jesus here. I'm just speaking whatever he tells me to speak. So I'm constantly praying, Lord, 
open my ears to hear what you're saying so that I can speak those things. And God, open my eyes to see what you're doing so that I can join you in your work. Anybody ever heard of this uh, um, Bible study, like Henry Blackaby, um, Experiencing God? Has anybody gone through it 10 times already? Yeah. Lillian's like, "Mm mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Right? Like, one of the main parts of what it's talking about is see where God is at work and join him in it. (laughs) Right? So it's just this good interaction of as I look for God, as I seek to see God, I will also see as God sees. So good. What else? I get the song, Give Us Clean Hands. Uh huh. I'm sorry, I don't know what that song is. Can you sing it for me? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding with it. Yeah. Give us clean hands. Give us pure hearts. Yep, that one. Mm-hmm. Let us not lift our souls to another. Right? That's good. You see, who couldn't help it? Who couldn't help it? Yeah, KJ in the back. God, let us be. <laughs> Anybody in youth group in the 90s besides me and KJ? Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> so we're like, yeah, but not your youth group. <laughs> All right. Yes. There are so many distractions in the world, and the, the enemy wants to pull our focus away and get us to look at like the wind and the waves. Yeah. To get distracted, get our, our eyes off of Jesus. But yeah. If we're pure in heart and we're just focused on him, we will see him. And yeah. He's going. Yeah. That's good. So she's talking about there's so many distractions in this life. Right, So many things are trying to get our attention, get our efforts off track. But when we're pure in heart, we are more focused on him. And really that kind of speaks toward an issue of this matter that we'll dive into more with the whole, what does it mean to be pure in heart? But it is for sure a oneness. Like I am singularly focused. I am singularly attentive. I am singularly going after with everything. Purity. So one other thing that we didn't mention, if you remember, I said a lot of like the rewards that Jesus is talking about, they have both a here and now and a forever kind of component to it, right? So part of the pure in heart, one thing that they will experience is they will see God in the perfection of that moment in heaven for all eternity right? Like, and that's important for us to reiterate. And it's not, that probably wasn't mentioned because people didn't know that. It was probably because we are, as we should, building off of the fundamental, foundational basis of hope that we have, that we get to spend eternity with him. That is something that as the kingdom is at work within us, and again, remember, this is not a works-based thing. Jesus is not saying, if you will be pure in heart, then you will get salvation. Because he's setting the stage. He's setting them up to realize the kingdom is here. The kingdom is at hand. You guys have been living under a covenant that said, if you trust me, if you believe me, live by these rules as a way, live by these commandments that are good for you, by the way. It's not just a list of rules I told you because they're the house rules. It's a, these are good for your life. And if you trust me, if I am your God, if if you realize the difference between me, a perfect and holy God, and you, it should lead you to joyfully do these things, not just in obedience, but as an act of worship. And you've been living under this idea that has, especially when Jesus comes on the scene, has been so twisted and so thwarted and so just turned around to this, if I do A, B, and C, I'm self-justified and I deserve and earn salvation, basically. He's saying, it's not about that. But when this kingdom that I'm talking about is at work in you, and he's setting the stage because he is the one who issues this new covenant. It'll be through his blood, through what he does, not when you work harder. We're going to come back to that over and over because we have to be reminded lest we slipped, slip back into a, worst, a works-based theology. Yes, 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 I'm, I'm saved by faith, right? But are you sanctified by faith too? 
Or do you think that you look more like Jesus when you work harder to look more like Jesus? He's saying when the kingdom is at work within you, and might I even go as far as to say, when you allow the kingdom to be at work within you, it'll create in you a clean heart, a pure heart. So there's this eternally when we die or when Jesus returns, the benefit, the blessing of seeing God, right? And, and perhaps it's good to, to see and understand that phrase of they shall see God as you will be brought into his presence. So there's this very real, very literal example of when we die, we will be brought into his presence and we will see him face to face in complete fullness. The type that goes beyond what Moses encountered because God told Moses, you can't see me or you will die. But I'll like put you, I'll, I'll tuck you into the rocks and then I'll let you like see the, my backside and see my glory. As my glory passes by, you'll be able to look at that, right? Which brings us to the next Thing. There are instances, they seem to be fewer and further between in scripture and in real life experience of these individuals who did have some sort of it brought into his presence, like Moses, who saw, face God, uh, who saw God face to face, like Isaiah, who was caught up, was in the throne room and saw God and said, oh, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. And here I am before you. And he had to be purified in that moment. Who had an encounter where he got to see God because of the purity, I would say, of his heart before God. Amen. Remember the whole, when God's like, man, who, who, sh who, sh who should we send? Anybody know? Who should we send? Isaiah. Send me. I'll go. Right? That purity of heart to do something for the Lord. Um, you also have uh, Paul, when he was Saul on the road to persecute, on the way to Damascus to, to, to enslave Christians for the faith, had an encounter with Jesus after Jesus had already uh, died, raised again, and ascended. He's encountered in this literal seeing him, right? Again, few and farther between, but we're just listing all the different things that this could mean, right? But there's also less literal ways where we encounter the presence of the Lord. I think, Jamie, you, you did a good job of, of defining that aspect of just these moments where like you have an encounter with the Lord and you just experience his goodness and his glory. It's often overwhelming too. Amen. Yeah. Can anybody attest to what I'm talking about? Just those moments where you just get it. You just realize you're just in the moment you're experiencing that. And some of them, I think I've told of this beforehand, but um, when we were planting the church, like right before the, in the summer before the church opened and stuff, uh, like I was just encountering so much spiritual warfare, just so much. And the Lord allowed me to walk through a shortened season where I actually was not hearing the Lord as specifically as I had heard before in my 28 years of faith. And since, it was this unique, just heavy spiritual attack, not surprising, on one of the one of the lead pastors is getting ready to try to start a church in Athens, right? Um, but I remember we had set up the room and Lindsay and I came in here and we just prayed. We were just praying in this room and I had a sense of the presence of Jesus. And this is gonna make no sense, sorry. It may make less sense to some of you in the room, <laughs> um, but like, it was, it, was this, it was this feeling as though, like, I knew in the moment. My eyes could not see it. In fact, I dare not turn around to verify, but I knew I wouldn't have seen it anyways if I had turned around, but I knew he was standing behind me. And there was just this spiritual sense that he was walking around the room, and it was as if he was wearing this robe, and as if this robe was, like, super saturated with peace, and it was just sloshing peace everywhere. And I was just encountering the peace of the Lord in my heart. This was an encounter with him, and it was in such a special time when I needed him. I did not, in the middle of the season where I'm trying to hear more from the Lord, more go back to how I've been here. I'm just not hearing things at the moment, right? He did not say anything to me. He didn't even pr like provide with the thing I was wanting the most or deal with that immediately. He just showed up and gave his peace. Now, the rest of that story is for another day and another purpose for why I believe the Lord allowed me to walk through that. I, 
some short stories because I think a lot of us walk through those seasons. And it's helpful to know you're not the only one. You're not the one who's so messed up that you don't hear from God anymore and he just doesn't speak to you anymore, right? I can walk alongside some people and share from that experience. But God is good. If you are currently in that season, can I tell you, it is just a season. It is just a moment. If there's sin in your life, deal with it, but it might not be because there's sin in your life. You need to hear that too. Sometimes the Lord will use and allow things to build things that only through those ways can they be built. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm preaching more sermon than one right now. Okay, all right, let me come back. Uh, so it's this, the less literal ways of experiencing the presence of the Lord. It's, it's that uh, road to Emmaus kind of feeling. Do you remember when Jesus came back? I love that, that, that these two guys are walking to Emmaus like Jesus has died on the cross, right? And he's risen again, and some people are claiming, we've seen Jesus, he's alive, right? And the whole, whole area, whole region is, is in an uproar talking about it, and Jesus comes walking along, these two guys discussing, he's like, hey, what you guys talking about? And they're like, have, have you not heard? Like, and Jesus just started, like, his identity is concealed from them. They don't realize it's Jesus. And then he starts talking about the scriptures that were pointing to this all along. And then later, like, when they get to a place, like, oh, please eat with us. And he eats with them. And then, he, and then like, he blesses the food and everything. And then, like, he, he disappears. And they're like, and they, they realize it was Jesus. And they make this comment. They're like, was not our hearts burning within us as he spoke, right? It's that feeling, that kind of encountering Jesus where you may not see him and it may not be, I didn't realize that was Jesus. I had an encounter with what I thought was a normal person. It was Jesus, possible, but not even necessarily what we're talking about, that encounter of like, he just speaks something to you in that moment and your hearts just catch on fire because they're words of truth and they're him pure heart will seek his face. We'll seek to see him, no encounter him. This is why I believe Paul says in the book of Ephesians and he prays that they would have the hearts, that they would have um, the eyes of their hearts opened to purity and to see him. And then the last thing I would say is seeing God also carries this beautiful reality of being seen by God. I want to see God, but it's also so beautiful when I see him to be seen by God. My wife, has, Lindsay, has started this thing um, where when somebody sneezes around her, instead of just saying, bless you, she says, the blessing. Uh, <laughs> she says, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Right, may be gracious to you and turn his face towards you. And there's my little boy right there, four years old. Every time it happens, he looks for his daddy. And he turns his, and then I'm turn my head to look at him at the same time. Because he wants to see his father, but he also wants to be seen by his father. See him, but no, he's looking too. Be seen by him. It is a beautiful, when I talk about the goodness that is available here, to see God, to see as he sees, to see him at work in the mundane, in nature, in and through other people, and to be seen by him. This is a beautiful, this is a deep, this is a rich gift to us. Who wants that? Like, for real, like, who, who, who wants that? <laughs> I love that I can say rhetorical things here, and it's, it's not rhetorical. Um, the question becomes, how can we get it, right? I want it, and, and you know the question we ask, well, how bad do you want it, right? Again, make sure you hear as, you are sift, as we're sifting through this, this is not a, if I work hard enough, I will get. 
okay? First, let's look at a couple of parallel passages I'm just going to read out to you real quick um, that deal with the same concept of blessed are those who are pure in heart for they will see God. In Psalms chapter 24, verses three through four, it says, David says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? That's seeing the Lord. That's being in his presence as we've talked about. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. So you see that pure heart. You see clean hands too. James, so let's go, okay, so that's before the cross. Let's go after the cross to James chapter four, verse eight, where he says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Oh, look at you, KJ. I did not send her those. She just, I, I saw you pop into my notes uh, while I was preaching. Be careful who you give access to. Um, no, I'm just kidding. James 4, 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. You just stop right there at that verse and say yes and amen. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you men of double mind. Mindedness. Ow. Anybody ever get a sense that James is really not worried about offending you? <laughs> it's for your good. Draw near to God and, we, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. So we see again this concept of cleanse your hands, right? Cleanse your hands and purify your hearts again, you double-minded. But what's different here and what's interesting is that James gives us an insight into what it means to purify your hearts. As we try to understand the pure in heart, are, are, are those who are um, uh, blessed are those who are pure in heart. What, is, what does that mean? What does that look like? We start with heart. Okay, so I have a pure, pure is the adjective, like the pure in heart. So what's, what's the noun? What's the thing that needs to be dealt with? And then the adjective describes how it needs to look and what it looks like. But the heart goes beyond just like what we understand, right? Um, like the organ of the heart. It is used like that, but it's also used in the Greek um, to talk about the soul, the mind, as it is the fountain and seat of the thoughts, the passions, desires, appetites, affections, purposes, and emotions. All those different things are wrapped up into this word that blessed are the pure in heart that deals with that. It goes beyond just like the feelings and stuff. And you see here in James, when we talked about a singleness, a oneness, in aim and focus and purpose, that James addresses it here. Those who need to become pure in heart are double-minded. They think one thing, do the other. Or they want people to think they think one thing, but yet think another. You also see within this something that's interesting, something that's, that's going on here, because even from the Old Testament, then Jesus, excuse me, then Jesus, and then after, in James, you see a sense of cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. There is, do not, do not be mistaken, this life as a believer is beyond just believing just the eternal. It's supposed to produce an outward. There should be a cleansing. There should be an outward cleansing. There should be a true repentance that leads to a pure inwardness. This is the problem Jesus had with the Pharisees. Do you remember what he called them? Whitewashed tombs. Think about that phrase. There's a tomb which has what in it? A dead body. And here's somebody just spraying white. Like, oh, this is clean. This is pure. This is, this is holy. Because I've spray painted white on the outside of it. So the inside must be fine. You whitewash tombs. And he told them, hey, go wash the inside of the cup, not just the outside of the cup. Because yes, there is an expectation that our lives should look different. There should be a true repentance, but that should lead and come from a place of inner purity and work of the heaven, of the kingdom at work within us. 
In Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said, love the Lord with all your heart. In fact, he said that was of the greatest commandment there was. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right? But love him with all your heart. So many, I think, look at this verse and think, I need to work harder to love God more. I have to, it's like I have to crank out like a higher output with my heart. That's the way we approach that verse. That's the way I think some of us sometimes approach God in that way. And, and okay, I'm, that's the greatest commandment, so that's what I'm going to do. But instead, the correct perspective in response to this is actually how much of my heart does God have? Do you see the difference there? It is not love the Lord with all of your heart, so therefore I've got to work harder with my heart to love God. It's how much of my heart does God have? (laughs) If a woman, if a wife who has a husband also has a boyfriend, If she has given 95% of her heart to her husband and 5% of it to another, the husband is not concerned with the percentage output of the part that he has. He is not concerned about her giving 100% effort towards 95% possession. Do you see that? James, again, who's really not worried about offending you, will call you foolish if you think you can have friendship with the world and not be an enemy of God. You can't. It is either you are single, and he will go on. I I said foolish. He's saying you adulterous people. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. He's not interested in 95% possession, but with 100% effort. Love the Lord with all your heart is not about trying harder in the areas of your life you want to give to him. It's about give it all to him. I promise you, when you look at output, if you will, what others are doing for the kingdom, he's not looking at you saying, I wish you would do that more. He first and foremost, where you need to start and where you need to live from is, I just want all of you. I want all of you. And whatever I do in you, leave it to me. Just be obedient to however I lead you, but leave it to me. James does a good job of saying things that sometimes as a pastor, you're like, oh, I don't know if I can say that in the sermon. Like, that's not going to go over well, but if I just read what's in Scripture, <laughs> like, I just let him say it, right? Just that concept of an adulterous relationship. We would never want to consider that what our relationship with God looks like, would we? We would never want God to look at us as an adulterer, but yet there's things that we're unwilling to give to him. And we think that if we just work harder in the things that we are giving to him, that it's okay. And I think the example of a husband and a boyfriend is is good enough. But for the sake of you visual learners out there, I have another example. I could use some of this. Some water. Actually, I'm kind of thirsty this one. How many of you know that if you live in a neighborhood, some of your neighbors have dogs? Where are we at here? Hold on. Tell you what, how about you come up and drink it? 
is water. In fact, most most of that is water. That's probably like at least 95% water. Drink it. I tell you what, this, this is my offering to you, Tony. Drink it. But yet we think that 95% of our life is good enough to give to God. And like he'll just drink it up readily, right? That's how we feel. Or that's how we act sometimes. Right? The billboards, the marquees that some churches are bold enough to put, like he's either Lord of all, of all or he's not Lord at all, offend you because you're like, yeah, but. And those buts just never work out. Was anybody like kind of offended that I did that? I kind of hope, I kind of hope you are to be honest with you, because our sins are more offensive to a God when we try to come before him. This is purity. Purity was what that glass was before I was okay with this being in it. And it doesn't have to be mostly bad stuff for it to be a problem, any of it. And this could speak towards salvation. All it takes is one sin for it to be no longer clean, no longer pure, no longer holy. We have been called to a holy, perfect righteousness of God. That glory that God has is in absolute perfection with zero sin, completely untainted. And all have fallen short of the glory of God. And the penalty of that is a separation from him called death. Here and now, we feel that relationally. We feel the impact of separation and distance from God. And if it's not dealt with, then it will result in an eternity of separation from him in a very real place of pain and suffering called hell. But my bracelet, when I turn it over, says, if you must, but you must believe Call on him and repent. Romans 10, 9. Confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Why? Because he really is the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except through him. So for some of you, the concept of pure of heart starts with a relationship with him in the first place where we accept and believe by faith that Jesus died on the cross for my sins, for your sins, and allow the kingdom to be at work within you at a place where you will confess the reality of that. The absolute inability for you to deal with the sin in your life. The inability for you to be at a place of forgiveness with God's grace and God's mercy apart from faith in what Jesus already did. First, by faith. It's by grace through faith that we're saved. And we're made pure. I say this over and over. Isaiah talks about even the good deeds are as filthy rags in the Old Testament. Yet somehow in Revelation, it's the church who's adorned in white, pure, spotless, which are the deeds of the saints that she was given the ability to wear. Something happened where the good deeds were filthy rags and now they are pure, spotless, and bright. His name is Jesus. Amen. And that's my first invitation to you to start that. I'm going to leave that up there to defend you as much as you want. <laughs> Interestingly, I love this. Oh, man, y'all know I'm a word nerd. I love it. There's so much depth to it. Some of y'all love the phrase word nerd. Yeah. Looking at you, Hannah, without looking at you. All right. Interestingly... The word pure in Greek has a really neat and fascinating, like, specific, like, how the process through, like, when they use that word in Greek to, to say pure, it means uh, that which is made pure either by fire or by pruning. How deep can your quiet time be with just a few words? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. <laughs> Let's read Malachi 3, 1 through 5. 
Oh, man, this is so good. Man, it's, it's been there for years and years and years and years. It's been there. Don't jump ahead of me, because I want to ask a question, KJ, real quick. But uh, Malachi, verse, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 2, right here. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. Fuller is a washer who would wash clothes and stuff like that of the soap, right? Nice. Verse 3. You're good. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver. Go back to the first verse. Amen. Question. Honest honest question. When you hear an Old Testament verse like Malachi, who says, there's one who's coming, and he will come like a refiner's fire, and he will purify the sons of Levi with this fire. How many of you, in all honesty, your first thought jumps to one of judgment and condemnation? That God is coming to, 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 to remove the wicked people that have been in the roles of Levites, for example, in his temple. How many of you, like, that's the first, like, your thought is he's coming in a, in a form of judgment to deal with this? Anybody? Anybody be bold enough to say that? Okay. What's interesting is that that is not at all what he says. Go back to verse 3. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and and as in former years. What the refiner is coming to do with this fire that we don't like to think of ourselves as going through, is he is purifying for himself a people that will offer unto him offerings that are pleasing unto him. So often we think of the fire, a refining fire, something that's purifying fire from God as, oh no, he's going to get me for all that's wrong with me. And while we need to understand, that needs to be dealt with. That is a very real reality of That's a problem to have that. What his heart and why he's coming is for your good. We run from the idea of refinement. We don't like the idea of being laid bare before God and all of our things just being out there and dealt with in front of him. We often will respond in shame or the idea of it, for some of us, maybe sometimes we respond in fear because we don't actually want to let go of a few things we know he's going to bring up. Either we stay in this place of shame and running from God because of what we know is going to rise to the top as dross rises to the top when something's being refined and removed, all the impurities are removed. We're ashamed of what we know will rise to the top. But the enemy has succeeded in lying to you and saying that you don't deserve to be in that place in his presence in that process, or he's gonna, God's going to be so ashamed of you, you might as well don't even deal with it. And so you isolate, and you never deal with that. And in shame, you just remain in this place in your faith. Or some of us know what's going to rise to the top or what he's going to ask you to lay down. And in fear, we won't even do that. We won't sit before him. Hey, God, I want to talk about this right here. I'm not talking about that. I need you to work and move in this. Uh Thoughts about that are coming up? No, no, no. No. (laughs) I have a thing over here I need us to deal with. I don't want to talk about that 5% that I'm not giving to you. Mm. But it's for our good. 
How many of you know that John the Baptist, when he came, he said, by the way, there's one coming who will baptize you with the Spirit and with fire. Amen. That the blessings of this kingdom will be that he will take you and say, I love you so much, but I want to deal with this thing in you for your good. Yeah. Refining fire by a really good, and can I say gentle, refiner. Amen. We look at him with fear. And if, and if we're honest with ourselves, if we were to assess spiritual maturity, I would say one of the indicators of spiritual maturity, what we understand and what we get from the gospel is how we respond regarding sin. When I mess up, what do I do? Do I look at God as though he's ashamed of me? Do I just allow guilt and condemnation to pour over me and I just remove myself I remove myself personally further from God. Sin already caused a, a, an issue and a division relationally, right? Even though my salvation is kept and secure, but relationally, I feel that like I had a fight with my wife or something like that kind of thing. I'm still married to my wife and still love her and everything. I know she loves me, but like I, did, I said something I probably shouldn't have said, right? Like that needs to be dealt with. But God wants reconciliation. He wants to purify your heart. Amen. And man, when we look at the other example of refiners, like that which is refined and through fire and that which is pruned, man, some of us even more so are like, man, I don't, I don't want that. We don't like the idea or the process of being pruned. But remember, what is the purpose of pruning? What is it? Producing. The purpose of pruning is production. Amen. We're afraid of being laid bare, of laying ourselves bare before him saying, have your way. Because we're afraid we're going to lose things. And he's trying to tell you, I'm going to give you more things that are way better. But we struggle. But when the kingdom is at work in us and through us, in our hearts, it produces a purity of heart I think I mentioned this last week, that not only says, okay, God, I'm okay, but goes back and says, what else can we deal with? What else can you find? Let's dig deeper. Because it really is good. And you see God and the gentleness and the goodness of God as refiner and as pruner in your life. And it's something you start to desire. It's possible. It's possible. Um, I... I often give an example. I, I think I had, if, if I had a conversation with somebody recently, I can't remember who it was, um, but uh, it's this idea of like the things that God may deal with in our life, like considering it, they, they mentioned like it's like putting a whole bunch of junk in your bag that doesn't belong on the journey, right? And I remember saying like, I, I use a similar illustration, but I typically say it's the junk that's on the, that, that we attach to the outside of our bag. Because Jesus called us to walk a narrow path. And that path being narrow sometimes may have trees and branches and stuff along the side that he may be calling us on a journey that those things just can't go down that path. They will get snagged. Most certainly sin are such things. We are not called to walk a narrow path journey with God and carry sin with us along. And the reason why I use the outside of the bag instead of the inside of the bag is because sometimes we think, now every illustration breaks down at some point, but sometimes we think if I hide my sin enough, it'll be okay. It may weigh me down, but if I can, if I can work harder, if I can push through in my own strength, I'll get there. I'll be dog tired, but I can still get there. And what Jesus is trying to say is, no. Down this narrow path, those things must go. Sin must go. In fact, I'm not asking you to barely get there. That's why it says in Hebrews to release all the sin that so easily entangles. Why? Because you're supposed to run the race. Amen. He wants you to run Amen. and get there. He wants you to finish that ath half and be like, let's do five more right now. <laughs> all the ones who are tired, their bodies, their strength is tired. But the pure in heart allow the kingdom to be at work in them and through them. 
I remember in my life, it most certainly is the sin that needs to go in your life. Sin is not a desire of God for you to carry with you on your journey, wherever your journey is at and wherever your journey is to. Sin is not a part of it. It is not God's intended part of your life. It has to be dealt with. But what you will find is that there are things of this life that God also wants you to take off your bag that will get snagged along that narrow path that aren't even necessarily bad in and of themselves. It doesn't mean that because God is telling you he wants you to lay it down that it's a bad thing or it's a simple thing. I'll give you an example. In my life, so I'm, I, don't, I can't even believe I'm going to share this. This is one of the things that's like a nerdy side of me that I don't share with a lot of people. I love games. Any kind of sport, any kind of game, I'm in. I'm also a big board game player, right? I'm blessed to, to have a family where my in-laws love playing board games. We play board games all the time. And not just the like sorry and Monopoly, but like the like strategy games, like the, the heavy games, the games that take you like a couple of hours to play kind of thing like we li- I, I like games, and I like them so much, I can't believe I'm saying uh, I invented a game. I literally invented a board game. Like, and I, I'm not going, I, we're not going so authentic family that I'm going to throw up a picture of it or anything today. Like, that's not happening today. Sorry, God told me last minute. I didn't have time. Um, but like, but like I, I remember being at this place where I had even gotten to the stage where we tested it a couple times, Right? But then the Lord told me one night, he said, hey, just just by the way, you can go down that route. And it may even, like, it's not a bad thing. Like, it it could have even been something that provided a little bit of income if it had been, like, popular and took off or something. It was actually a good game, right? Like, in and of itself, it was not bad. There's no, like, themes in it even that are like, ooh, that's kind of, that's, that's not honoring to the Lord, Right? But the Lord told me, he said, you can either go deeper in this or you can go deeper with me. Mm. And it's not a condemning thing, he said. It was an invitation to me. Because in that moment, he was inviting me into a season of walking deeper in him, learning more than I had learned in many seasons combined before that point, that when I laid that down, And that doesn't mean that if I ever touch it again, that I will be sinning against God or saying, well, I don't care about God or whatever. I know that during that season, during the journey, during the path of my journey, that from this section to at least this section or whatever, like that couldn't be attached to the outside of my bag. To have that as part of my life, my journey was not going to get me to where God was inviting me for that season. And so I laid it down. And I can tell you from experience, from what God taught me in that season, during that time, I would never make that trade. No matter how, if, if this was the most successful board game of all time and made millions and millions of dollars, I would never trade it for what God was inviting me into. And this is what I want to say. This is what I want to share with you as we get ready to, to walk closer into this. As I've spoken against the idea of um, sometimes we look at a beatitude and we consider the concept of seeing God as an all or nothing thing. Either I will see him or I won't get to. If I'm good and pure enough in heart, then I will get to encounter God. Or maybe he'll speak to me or maybe I'll actually deserve coming into his presence. None of those things lines up with the gospel. How do I know that? Because of the many scriptures that teach against that specific concept and idea, Hebrews chapter 10 gives the awesome illustration. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. Now, let me just start with it real quick, real quick, because some of you are like, what does that mean? (laughs) In the Old Testament, the Old Covenant way, you would have the temple, you would have the out, out, outdoor area where there would be sacrifices for sins, offerings that are made. There's an altar there, right? There's a purification before there. You'd have people who are singing and minister to in the Lord. And then you'd have a holy place, a tented holy place where there was the table of the showbread. There was the, the, the candle and the lamps. There was the incense and everything. And then there was another curtain, a very thick curtain, measured by hand breaths, how thick it was and how tall it was, right? That separated that holy place from the most holy place, 
where the Ark of the Covenant, the Ten Commandments, Aaron's staff, and the high priest and the presence of God dwelt, right? And the high priest, only one man, one time a year, was able to enter if he had done all the purification processes before getting into that. So Jesus, in his flesh, this is why when we sang today that the earth began to shake, when Jesus died, go back and read it. There was an earthquake in the land. Yeah. Even the Roman centurions were like, surely this was the son of God. Right. The pagan soldiers, surely this was the son of God. Look at what he's doing. Earth began to shake. And in the temple, symbolically, that veil that separated the holy of holies was ripped in two. Yeah. Because what Jesus was doing was saying, you're the temple. It's no longer a place. And he's coming to dwell with all of you, not just all one of you entering one time a year. And his, his sacrifice was the sacrifice that brought purification. And, and now I no longer have to live in this works-based idea that if I work hard enough, if I do good enough, I deserve or can be in the presence of God. Jesus accomplished that already. Amen. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of what? Faith. With our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering for he who promised is faithful. Do you see over and over? It's not about what you do. It's about what he's done. Amen. Faith in what he has done. And this is what I want you to finish with in realizing when we talk about blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God is that true purity and the process of purification is not an achievement you work towards becoming, Amen. especially not an achievement you work towards earning, but it's rather an invitation into living as you already are if you're a son or a daughter of the king. If you in this moment have surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior already, you are a son of the king or a daughter of the king, when you go back and read Jesus' discipling words of blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God, your response is not let me work harder to get to a place where I can be and see him and encounter his presence. Where I can deserve a place. Jesus already did the doing. You gotta be the being. Purity of heart will cause me to run from sin to God. And in those times when I sin, purity of heart is real with God and understands I can stuff all I want to inside the backpack. He knows what's in the backpack. Can't hide anything from God. Purity in heart is being real enough with God to say that even when I sin, and almost as immediately as I sin, with a true, pure oneness and focus towards God and realizing what he has done and who I am in him, it will, even when I sin, cause me to run to God. Do you get that? Purity in, 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 in heart will cause me to, to run from sin to God, but even when I sin will cause me to run to God Amen. and not from him in shame. Over and over and over I say it, because there has, there's therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. So if you have Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you have accepted by faith what he has already done to deal with your sin, then seek purity. Run towards him. And if you haven't yet, run towards him. Amen. It's the same response. This is why this is so good, and then I'm, I'm going to have a stand and, and do practical steps. But why this is so good is because in the stories of revival, those who have experienced and even those who are experiencing revival, what happens is that this beatitude becomes both a reality of and a consequence of revival, that like there is this hunger and this thirst for righteousness that leads God's people to desire a purity of heart. And they will look at their lives and I'm not trying to offend you. You know what? Forget it. James is my example. I'm trying to offend you. 
that if you, if you make an assessment of the things you spend your time doing, you, you might realize there's an imbalance be, between what I say I want in the Lord and where I want to go with him and what I'm actually holding on to. And what I do and how I spend my time and the things I do in my time, they may not be in and of themselves sinful things, but they just won't go down that path. They can't, you, you can't hold on to those things and go down that narrow path. Just like the raccoon that gets stayed, his hand stays in the trap because he can reach in and grab it, but he's not willing to let go of it to get his hand out. I don't know why I use that example. <laughs> He'll stay in the trap. He's outside the trap, but he's stuck because he's unwilling to let go of the thing you reached into. And pull out. He can't have both the freedom and the thing at the same time. Maybe that hit somebody this morning. I don't know. Why don't you stand with me real quick, please? Practical steps this morning and this week from this place. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart. How much of your heart does God have? When we do worship in a minute, and go back into that place, I want you to ask that question. I want you to sit down with the Lord and talk about that question. How much of my heart have I given you? And if it's anything short of 100%, can I, can I lovingly encourage you to lay whatever percentage you have not given to him unto the Lord? If that means giving your life and surrendering to him as Lord and Savior, let's do it. Come to me if you have questions, I'll be right over here. If you need the altar, just as an outward actionable, it's open. Take it before God. I want to encourage you this week to find extended, uninterrupted time where you sit down and have a spiritual inventory together with God. Pray the prayer of the psalm that was written, Psalm 139, 23 through 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there is any grievous way, any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. In response to that, beg for him, Psalm 51, 10 through 12. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Why? Because he's the one that does the work of the kingdom within you, by the way. Amen. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Amen. And then lastly, number three, create accountability. A pure heart is not afraid to say, brother, sister, I need help. I want purity. I don't want to fight this on my own. I want it so bad I want to see God work so badly that I'm willing to open myself up and say, will you come alongside me in prayer or whatever is necessary, whatever will help fight against this thing. I promise you God wants it more than you do. Are those acceptable terms? Is that okay for us to do this week? Am I asking too much? I promise you. God can do so much through this. Amen? Let's pray. Father, would you give us the courage? Would you give us the courage to come before you and say, here I am. Whatever part of me doesn't look like you, let's deal with it. Whatever sin is in my life, whatever I would never carry into the holy of holies in your presence. I pray that you would grant a ruthless assassination of those things this morning and this week. And God, I pray for a boldness that whatever, as people open their hands completely unto you, and whatever you reveal to say, hey, what I'm inviting you into in this season, are you willing to lay that down? and lay that down, even if they're not sinful and bad, bad things, Father. I pray that you would grant boldness to do that. And in any areas 
where we could use accountability to help bolster discipline, to help spur one another on to love and good deeds. Lord, we are here for each other. You created us for community. I thank you for that. So I pray that you would bring to mind any individuals that are in anybody's life as they think through, who would I even ask? Would you, would you grant them the understanding of who they can ask? And would you grant to them the loving accountability that leads to so much life? We want to see revival, God. Purify our hearts. Work in our hearts that we may run towards and with revival. We want to see you. Thank you for wanting to see us. I pray all these things because I know that's what you want because of what Jesus has done already. Thank you for sending me.